Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have an inspiring businessman, doctor, author, CEO, whisperer, Dr. Mark Goulston. He's a prominent psychiatrist, consultant to many major organizations, including IBM, ESPN, and hostage, hostage negotiation trainers for the FBI, if you can believe it. His book called Just Listen, Discover the Secret to Getting Through to Absolutely Anyone. And that is true. I just listened to it. It helped my me get my daughter actually into the shower where it would have been like a hostage situation. It's ranked number one in six Amazon categories. It's been translated into 14 languages and it became the basis of a 2010 PBS special. And this is just one of his six books. The Consumers Research Council three times named him one of America's top psychiatrists. And for over 20 years, he was a clinical assistant professor of medicine at UCLA's Neuropsychiatric Institute. Dr. Goulston has been appeared on Oprah, The Today Show, CNN, many more. His articles have been featured all over Huffington Post, Psychology Today. And he's also the co-founder of Heartfelt Leadership. Dr. Mark Goulston, thank you for joining me. Well, I can hardly wait to find out what I say. <laughs> the first, and I always like to include a fun fact, which we'll get into. But I have to ask: um, tell me about, walk us through how you teach hostage negotiation trainers, and what was the scenario where people used it? Well, how I got into that, a little bit of my background yeah. is: I I was trained as a clinical psychiatrist, and I was a suicide and violence interventionist. So I would intervene and often make a, a difficult situation sometimes calmer. And so I gave a presentation to a uh, middle, middle group uh, set of parents, and someone from the FBI uh, was speaking, and the presentation was on uh, how to keep your child safe. So the FBI guy, a, guy, a wonderful guy named Brent Braun, uh, uh, talked about various things, and my presentation uh, and, and one of my signature presentations is that I often play a devil's advocate to the uh, audience. So my presentation was called, It's My Party and I'll Die If I Want To. It's pretty so edgy. I play, yeah, a little bit edgy. Yeah. And so I played this uh, teenager uh, taking on these middle school parents or high school parents. And I said, and here is my challenge. I said, uh, you know, I have a 4.3 acne, uh, and no social life, and yes, I am going to this party this weekend, and no, you are not calling the parents, and there will probably be drugs, and booze, and guns, and you've ruined my social life, and so you're not going to ruin it anymore, and then I, and then I said to the uh, parents, I said, now, I, I, I stepped to the side, and I said, now, you, he doesn't have much judgment, you have to keep him safe, and so, uh, I did that scenario, and what was interesting is the FBI agent said, that's kind of fascinating, and so some of my early presentations uh, to the FBI, which were the, the presentations, and then I'd do some drive-alongs, but some of my early presentations were, uh, I, what would happen is I would wear a suit, I'd take off my suit, I'd have a police uniform underneath it all. I hadn't shaved for two weeks, and I had a pair of glasses where one was broken. And so these are all kind of advanced police and FBI hostage negotiators. And, and my challenge to them when I got into my police uniform was, uh, I'm the guy in your, uh, you know, in your department that shot the kid with the plastic gun last year, and I've been on medical leave for a year. And unless you talk me out of it, I'm going on permanent leave. And then I pull a gun out and hold it to my head. And I say, and then you live with the ghost of someone you couldn't save. And this time, it's one of your own. And no matter what they did, I just jammed it down their throat. And so what happened is I learned, uh, I developed the ability to go inside a certain persona. And so, uh, and, and, and when I play that persona, no matter... Uh, what the audience does, I jam it down their throat, and then after they kind of cry uncle, I say, this is what you could have said but didn't say. Yeah. 
And I've actually taken that to a number of different settings, uh, including uh, Goldman Sachs, the managing directors of private wealth, where I played someone who was worth $200 million who took a hit down to 125. And I was thinking of changing from, uh, from Morgan Stanley to them, but why should I change to them? The William Morris Agency, where I played an uh, actor who was uh, 40-ish, and I was thinking of changing from CAA to them, but uh, why should I change to them? I think my favorite, next to the hostage negotiation training, though, is I, I've given presentations to uh, Terminal Island Federal Penitentiary, in which I would uh, speak to prisoners who were going to be released in the next six months to a year and a half, and my role play there, and these are all, these are 300 pound guys who've been lifting weights, and they all file in from the day room, I mean from the, day, the yard, uh, in, their, uh, in their suits, and the chaplains bring them in, and what would happen is I would take off my jacket and underneath I'd wear a black t-shirt, I'd grease my hair back, and I'd say to them, uh, and it was called rebuilding trust in your family. And what I would say to them is, I'm your younger brother. And if you, uh, and if you love our family, when you get released, move. You know, Mom uh, believes in Jesus Christ and she'll give you two, three, four chances but you know as well as I know that all you're ever going to be is a lying sack of crap loser. And if you think that I should respect you because you're my older brother, and then I just, I, I put my face like, you know, six inches away from like the biggest, the toughest guy in the room. I said, if you think I should respect you because you're my older brother, I will put your head through the effing wall. So how are you going to deal with that? Welcome home, bro. And then I just took on the audience and, uh, uh, until until they, I was so in character uh, that they that they started telling the chaplain, take this guy away, take him away, take him away. <laughs> and then from that position, I am able to then say, this is what you needed to say for me to give you a second chance. Mm -hmm. So what's the reaction when you do that role play at the penitentiary? Uh, well, they get a little agitated. They're all holding their Bibles. The chaplain brings them in. And so what happens is, is, is it's in, in, I wait until I agitate the group. And well, I'll tell you the answer because I got into the character of the, that younger brother. And again, I never know what I'm going to say because I'm just there in the moment. And I said to them, here's what you need to do. Uh, when you go home, you're going to break eye contact. You're not going to look anyone in the eye. And it's because you're probably feeling guilty or ashamed. And what your family's going to think is that you're planning your next heist hmm. and that you haven't learned anything. So this is what you need to do and we're going to practice it. You're going to go to every single person in your family and you're going to say this to them. And then you're going to meet with them uh, all together and you're going to look them in the eye and you're going to say, uh, look, uh, I, uh, I, I committed my crime. No excuses. I did wrong. And I paid, uh, you know, I paid with my prison term. Uh, and, and it's not because I'm black or Hispanic. I did wrong. You have to own up to it. Uh, and, I, and then what you need to say is look in their eyes. Look in your spouse's eyes, look in your kid's eyes, and you say to them, I know that when anyone brings up my name, that you are incredibly ashamed and humiliated that I'm your husband or I'm your dad. And then what you need to do is look that family, family member and then all of them together in the eye and say to them, but as God is my witness, in the place inside your head, where you are most ashamed that I'm your dad or I'm your husband, one day you will be proud. Hmm. And I told them that if you do this and we practice it, what's going to happen is they're going to give you another chance because you're making eye contact. But if you go back on that, uh, you not only deserve to come back to prison, you deserve to burn in hell. And the chaplains always say to me, do you have to use that last thing? And I, and I said, I got to because I'm on a roll. And so um, 
And the last time I did it, it was, it was really, it was really touching because one guy was leaving the room to go back into the yard. He must have been about six, seven, and he had hands the size of a baseball glove. And he looked at me, and he took my hand in both of his hands, and he said, "You know," and, and I don't think he was the sharpest bulb on the block. And he looked at me and he said, "You know." I didn't follow a, some of what you said, but I'm really going to think about it. Thank you for coming here today. Hmm. Wow. So I, I get a little uh, emotional, as you touching, can see. Yeah. And it, it's really touching. So, wow. uh, uh, but How do you, you know. get yourself in? Because that seems like not only are you in, uh, at least I would be uncomfortable in that type of situation, but then you're role-playing it in their face. Do you have to do a preparation before you do you do this, or are you just so used to doing it that it it's it's just nothing for you to go in and, and being kind of like a, a situation where most people would be uncomfortable? Well, here's the killer story from Just Listen, and uh, if I was a betting man, even though I've told you a few good stories, this seems to be the one that people remember. Mm -hmm. I used to be a suicide specialist, and my first mentor actually pioneered the field of suicide, a fellow named Dr. Edwin Schneidman, and he started the suicide prevention centers in Washington and Los Angeles. And what would happen is he would go up to the inpatient, uh, inpatient wards, psychiatric wards at UCLA, and he would do a consultation with a patient who was still suicidal, but not acutely so, who needed to be discharged. Uh, and who the residents didn't want to see because they felt the person suicidal, and so they couldn't be discharged without referring them to someone for follow-up. So uh, uh, Ed would call me, and he would always say the same thing. And he would say, Mark, I'm with this handsome young man. Mark, I'm with this lovely young woman. They're in a lot of pain, Mark. You could help them see them and then he'd give me the handoff and so there was one woman I was seeing who and knock on wood none of them committed suicide so I, I mean it's I, I think it was more luck than skill but who knows but the most suicidal was a woman I'll change her name we'll call her Nancy and I didn't think I was really helping her because I would see her two or three times a week she rarely spoke at me and if you're me this is Nancy. Hmm. And, uh, and I was seeing her probably, I don't know, about eight months. And I didn't think I was making any progress, but that was the longest she'd gone without a suicide attempt or being hospitalized. And so something I used to do every month is I used to moonlight at one of the state hospitals in Southern California. And you moonlight to pick up some extra money. And, you know, when you moonlight, you're... You work 48 hours, you're on 12, you're off 12, you're, you're taking turns with another psychiatrist and you, you, know, you admit, admit patients and you get called to the wards to write orders and you're a little overtired. So I was probably 36 hours without sleep when I saw her on Monday for one of our meetings. And again, I didn't think I was helping her except that was the longest she'd gone without you know, trying anything. And as I was looking at her, and she's like this again, suddenly all the color in the room disappeared. And it turned to black and white. And then the black and white started to get kind of creepy, gray, dark. And I thought, I'm having a stroke or I'm having a seizure. And But, you know, I'm young, I'm game. I'm thinking, well, it's kind of interesting. And so I do a neurologic exam on myself, and I'm going like this. You know, I'm tapping my elbows and my shelf, and I'm doing a neurologic exam on myself, and, and, and I say, I'm all here. I'm not having stroke. I'm not having a seizure. And then I thought, I don't know how it happened, but I am looking at the world through her eyes. Hmm. So I am looking at the world through those eyes, and so I leaned into it, and it got worse and worse and someone, uh, a, a, a 
priest friend of mine said, you went into the dark night of the soul. Hmm. And it was really awful. And because I was overtired, I blurted something out that normally I would keep to myself. And I said, Nancy, I didn't know it was so bad. And I can't help you kill yourself. But if you do, I will still think well of you. I will miss you. And maybe I'll understand why you had to. And then I said to myself, did I think that, or did I say that? And then I thought, damn, I just gave her permission. It was the first time she made eye contact with me and she's looking at me like that. And I'm looking in her eyes. And I said to myself, I got it right. And I thought, she, and, I, and I said, what are you thinking? And I thought she was going to say, thank you for letting me do it. I'm overdue. Right. And she looked at me and she looked right through me and she said, if you can really understand why I might have to kill myself, maybe I won't need to. Wow. And then the room came back, color came back, and she came back. She got a PhD. I think she has one or two kids. But what happened is it enabled me to look and listen and feel into people from their inside out. Years later, I was actually a, um, a an advisor to the prosecution in the O.J. Simpson uh, criminal trial. And I don't talk too much about it because they lost. But part of what I would do when I would sit in the courtroom is I could close my eyes, open them, and I could see I could look out at the courtroom from any person's position. Hmm. So one of the things that I did, uh, I don't know if you'll remember the trial, but I, I remember uh, there was a DNA expert named Robin Cotton. And she was a biology teacher, I think. And she had these big wide glasses and, and she came off really well. And so if you can imagine, she's in the witness chair and uh, there's a Judge Ito to her right, and the jury's to her left. So you can picture that. And she came off really well, and the DNA back then was very confusing. And one of the people cross-examining her from the uh, criminal defense side was a New York attorney named Peter Neufeld. Uh, he was partners with a guy named Barry Sheck, who started the Innocence Project afterwards, to really using DNA to get people who were innocent out of prison. Uh, but Peter Neufeld played terribly. He had spit in the corner of his mouth. I mean, he didn't play well in Southern California. And what I noticed is when that he would be at the podium, you know, in front of uh, where we were seated. And, and when you looked at him, he was fiddling with paper like this. He was kind of annoying. And then there to the right of the jury was Robin Cotton in the uh, witness stand. So can you picture this in your mind's eye? Yeah, yeah. And so what I suggested they do is uh, I said that when, whenever they show some uh, slides, they usually sh showed it behind the witness on the wall or a screen behind her. And I said... Every time they did that, have Robin Cotton say to Judge Ito, uh, I can see it much better from down here. And I said, let's position Robin Cotton right in front of the jury, looking up at the slides. And then when they looked over Robin Cotton's shoulder, what they would see is this Peter Neufeld like this in the background being agitated. So what I wanted to do was create a contrast between this calm, biology teacher presence and this pushy New York lawyer in the background because, you know, hopefully that would annoy him. So, you know, so, so I could see things uh, from any the part of the... Yeah, yeah. yeah, so And so uh, something I don't know that we'll get into, but, uh, but one of my latest things, and I am getting incredible traction with this, um, 
So I've transitioned from looking at the world from the point of view of a suicidal patient mm -hmm. or from the uh, point of view of a suicidal uh, police officer who wanted to do himself in. Uh, I've now, when I work with executives, I can now listen and see into their future. And so something that's just happened in the past six months, and I'm giving this talk, and I'm getting five out of five ratings from all the CEOs. I give it to healthcare CEOs. And the talk is called Hacking Steve Jobs, How to See into the Future. And, so, and they're going gaga over it because I'm able to teach them how to look at the world through Steve Jobs' eyes and look out at their market and what I've been able to do is deconstruct it into a formula that if you uh, apply this formula you'll be able to uh, understand your market much better than you ever did before. So that seems to be the killer app and I'm getting requests for that but really what it is is it's, is it's looking out and sort of dare, uh, noticing things. My late mentor, Warren Bennis, one of his favorite suggestions is try to be a first-class noticer. Mm -hmm. Because when you notice something, it's different than looking, watching, and seeing. And when you notice it, you become present in it. So like right now, I am noticing over you that poster, in Inspired Insider. And I'm actually noticing the capital I-N and the capital I-N font over each other. Hmm. Uh, and I'm actually noticing the relationship between inspired over insider. And I'm especially noticing the red font over the black font. Uh, and how that's different than the gray font over the dark gray font. And I'm noticing the difference between those and how... Uh, it's, it's an interesting juxtaposition because when I look at the gray inspired over the darker gray insider and the red inspired over the black insider, what I'm noticing is uh, the red inspired is not inspiring. It kind of grabs your attention. The gray inspired is sort of, is sort of under the radar. And I'm noticing that the combination of the red inspired next to the gray inspired, there's something kind of inspiring by the combination of those colors. So I, does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah. You know, and so, so you can teach yourself to notice things. And what happens is when you notice it and you're very curious about it. So here's a little giveaway about Steve Jobs, but this is just, you know, if people hear this uh, and they want to bring me in, there's much more. What Steve Jobs noticed early on in his career is when he first saw, I forget the lab that he went to, when he first saw a computer with a small screen and a big computer, that was like the beginning of personal computers. And so what I'm guessing he saw is... Uh, uh, this is going to be the beginning of personal computers and everybody's going to want one. But when I look at it, anybody who wants one doesn't care about the technology. They just want it to be reliable, simple, and beautiful so they don't have to put it away or hide it somewhere. So I think in his mind, what he thought is make it Simple, reliable, and beautiful, and we will one day own people who use computers. And his strategy was he'd recognize it if he saw it, so he couldn't build it. But what would happen is people kept building it, and then he'd say, nah, you know, kick off the on-off switch. But Steve, we're into it for 30 million. I don't care. I don't like the on-off switch. And so 
but does that give you an idea? I mean, that's sort of a taste of it. But that's mm -hmm. being able to really notice into. Mark, when did you realize you had this special talent for seeing from someone else's perspective? Um, so you're not minding that I'm going on and on and you're not asking me questions. I've got your attention. You have my so attention, got... yes. <laughs> um, okay. Um, one of my greatest accomplishments, and I've accomplished a fair amount, and you, know, and you were kind enough to list some of those. But I think one of my greatest personal accomplishments, and I don't know anyone who's ever done this, is I dropped out of medical school twice and finished. Why? Well, what happened is um, I kind of hit a wall where I was reading stuff and I was comprehending it, but I couldn't hold on to it or recall it. So a lot of my medical books were all yellow. I would just highlight them, and I was hoping that I could hold on to them, but I couldn't. So I took a leave of absence, and then I worked in, uh, during the first leave of absence, I worked in blue-collar jobs, and it was the, some of the most honest jobs I've ever done. I miss them. What did you uh, do? One, one of my favorite jobs. So I, I didn't work in a lab, and I didn't do medical stuff. I needed to get away and give my mind a rest. Mm. So my favorite job is that I set up displays in liquor stores and bars, and I worked for a liquor distributing company, and they gave me a van, and I would go to the south end of Boston, and I would put up these cray paper things, and then I'd engage in a negotiation with the barkeep and I'd say I will give you this Heineken windmill for your purse for your home if you will allow me to put one up on top of your bar for two months and and I'd be in these rickety ladders I'd see rat skeletons up there I'd be talking to the barkeep I loved it I mean I miss it it was just and I love these people and so what happened is my mind came back at that level and then I went back to medical school and then in three months, it all happened all over again. And so, again, I was passing everything. And by that time, I wanted, uh, by that time, the medical school was fed up with me because what I didn't know and what most people don't know is that you lose matching funds when someone takes a leave of absence and a space goes empty. So I came from kind of a tough childhood. I don't want to go into it. Um, and there was a fair amount of what I'd call conditional love. You know, my parents did the best they could, but yeah. you, you may know what conditional love yeah. is. You know, you're only as good as what you do, and it's yeah. never good enough. You know, and and both my parents are gone, and I miss them. And, mm, sorry to hear that. And, you know, well, and they were improvements over their parents, but you know, needless to say, it wasn't the happiest of childhoods. And so uh, I meet with the dean of the school, and the dean of the school is about fundraising. And, uh, and I'm not sure what we talked about because I'm not totally there. And so the dean of students, a guy named William McNary, Irish Catholic, Boston University Medical School, he... Uh, calls me and he says, Mark, Mark, got this letter from the dean. You better get in here. We got to talk about this, Mark. So I go in there. And so imagine that you're kind of broken down. And I read the letter and it says, I have met with Mr. Goulston. This is from the dean of the school to the dean of students. I've met with Mr. Goulston, suggested an alternate career Perhaps the cello. The cello? I don't know. That shows you how in touch the dean of school is. <laughs> and, and I'm hereby uh, uh, directing the promotions committee that he be asked to withdraw because I hadn't flunked up. Right. And here is one of the things that I tell parents and I tell teenagers. And I think a miracle happened, and I mean that quite literally, and I'll get to that in a couple minutes. I still have your attention? Yeah, of You're course. doing okay? Yeah. So given my background, 
I read that, and I said, uh, Mac, we call Dean McNary Mac. I said, what does this mean? He said, Mac, you've been kicked out. And what happened is, I didn't have any of my sarcasm or cynicism back. That was one of my defense mechanisms because this was the 70s and, you know, you could do that. And what was also good is I didn't go pathetic. I didn't go, oh, what am I going to do? What happened is when he said it to me, I just looked like this. And then after about 30 seconds, it was like a gunshot. And I know what it's like to have a gunshot because I had a perforated colon about 10 years ago. It felt exactly like that. And what happened is I just started to cry. And after about 30 seconds, I'm wiping my cheek because I don't know what it is. And so what it was is I was 100% raw, vulnerable, and open. I think if I'd done that at home... It might not have been received so well. Hmm. Although that's probably not true. I think if you're honest. So what I tell teens is if you have a halfway decent parent, just be totally honest when you're in trouble with your parents. Because when you start hiding a little, they think you're hiding a lot. And what happened is I was 100% pure grade raw. And so imagine my background and imagine hearing what Dean McNary said next. He said, Mark, um, I don't know how you did it because you're passing. So you didn't screw up, but you are screwed up. But if you got unscrewed up, I have a feeling that this school would one day be glad they gave you another chance. And so I'm tearing up because I don't understand kindness. And then remember this unconditional, this conditional kind of position of my psyche. So you're going to see it right now. So he says to me, he says, Mac, even if you don't get unscrewed, even if you don't become a doctor, even if you don't do another thing in your life, I would be proud to know you huh. because you have some goodness in you and you have no idea how much the world needs it. And you won't know it till you're 35. But you got to make it till you're 35. And so I, uh, so I looked down and uh, I didn't know what to make of him. And then he looked at me and he said, Mark, look at me. Look at me. And so I'm looking at him. And he says, you deserve to be on this planet, Mark. Do you understand me? and you're gonna let me help you. And something just switched inside me. And what's, and what's really weird, and then we'll get into other stuff. Thank you for letting me tell these stories. Yeah. I, I hope. It's very powerful. Thank you for wish, being open to sharing it. Um, I think there's something there. So I'm sharing the story with Reverend Jim Kowalski, and he's the main Reverend of St. John the Divine in Manhattan. It's the largest Gothic cathedral in the United States. So I'm sharing the story with him. And I, you know, I'm culturally Jewish. <laughs> and I'm sharing the story with him. And as I'm sharing it, and I'm, I'm feeling a little of it with you, you can pick it up, but with him, I suddenly, I'm just overcome with this warmth. And with this rush. And I said to him, Dean McNary was an angel. And I don't mean it figuratively. Hmm. I had an angel come into my life and he blessed me. And without missing a beat, Reverend Kowalski said, yes, he was. 
And if you're blessed by an angel, you walk differently in the world. And so I've chosen to accept it. But it gives you a responsibility that's unlike any other responsibility. And so the responsibility is to pay it forward. And I actually started a global community, co-founded it, called Heartfelt Leadership. And our mission is daring to care. And we interview people who are known as heartfelt leaders in their company. And we ask them three or four questions. And they're always the same questions and then they can go off track like I've gone off radar with you. And the three or four questions are, what are the values that you hold most dear? How did you come to develop those values? And how have you stayed true to those values? And how have they made you successful? So you can see where I develop my values. And I, I have no other choice. There's a calling. But we have interviews with Colleen Barrett. She was the president of Southwest Airlines. She was actually the assistant to the founder. And she, and she just, just took it to amazing places. One of my favorites is Gary Ridge. He's the CEO of WD40. And if you go to Heartfelt Leadership and click on Be Inspired, yeah. these are eight to 10 yeah. minute videos. I watched several touching. of them, yeah. Uh, and then one is Howard Bihar. And Howard Bihar was Howard Schultz's, I think Howard Bihar was the heart and soul of the company. And, and Howard Schultz is a good guy. But Howard Bihar wrote a book uh, called It's Not About the Coffee. Hmm. And so, you know, I would love to do TED events. We would love to do TED events with heartfelt leaders sharing their stories and then having people in the audience share their stories. But the point is, uh, it's a challenge. And so what I'm hoping to do is What's grab the challenge? People. Well, the challenge is uh, in this ROI world, people will say, yeah, you know, you know, you know this sounds like a kumbaya self. Uh, site. But the point is, I'll tell you something about heartfelt leaders. They confront conflict sooner than people who come from ego. They are honest, yeah. they are molded to their mission, to their people and their customers. They are the Jack Ma's of the world from Alibaba. And so, uh, so what's happened is the world really needs to care, but currently it doesn't want to. So I'm taking a side trip down hacking Steve Jobs because uh, uh, people are pursuing me for that talk. You can help me look at the world through Steve Jobs' eyes? Yep. Uh, and then uh, what I'm hoping is once I give people what they want, I'll give them what they need and what the world needs from them. But let's keep that secret. <laughs> so Mark, what did you do after the, the dean told you that then just, you know, until you're 35, what did you do next? Well, I did take that leave of absence. And it was interesting because I grew up in Boston, went to college at UC Berkeley, then went to med school back in Boston. And I had to get away from uh, all the shoulds in my head and all the shoulds from the East Coast and from Berkeley. So what happened is I went out to something called the Menninger Foundation, which is now in Texas, but used to be in Topeka, Kansas. And after World War II, the Menninger Foundation turned out about 20% of all the psychiatrists in this country. Wow. And, uh, uh, and so I didn't want to go to Europe and see the world. I just wanted to go heal. And to be honest, I knew nothing about psychiatry. I didn't know that I needed it. And so I drove to 
the Menninger Foundation during the oil embargo in the early 1970s. And I slept in the back of my Chevy Vega station wagon. And I remember it was like New Year's Eve or Christmas, and it was in the middle of the oil embargo. And I, I drove across the George Washington Bridge, and I was the only car on it because all the gas stations were closed. So what happened is I get to Topeka, and, and, I'm, and, and I'm, a, I'm a suburban kid from uh, Newton, Massachusetts. I don't know anything about schizophrenic farm boys. But what happened is I found a way to connect with schizophrenic farm boys. And at the Topeka State Hospital, there's no fences because where are you going to run? <laughs> where are you going to run in Topeka? There's no place to go and there's snow out there. And what would happen is I would just go on walks with these schizophrenic farm boys. Yeah. And I, I somehow connected with them. How did you do that? I think I saw something in them. Uh, I remember one particular schizophrenic farm boy who was nearly catatonic. And I would see him every day. And I don't think he really talked. But we'd go on walks, you know, around the grounds of Topeka State Hospital. And then I had this crazy idea, you know, because, you know, basically I wasn't hurting anyone. And the psychiatrist, I said, can I try some things? And they said, he's been here for a while. Try anything. And so I had this crazy idea. I remember I was seeing him in one of the offices. And there's something about state hospitals. I think it must be built into, you know, the architecture but they have the hardest linoleum floors in the world. I mean, I think they're harder than concrete. And so I'm seeing this young man, and I had this crazy idea. I said, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to try and help you. And he was, he was kind of a compliant. He was kind of passive resistant. So... You know, he would go along with me. He wouldn't talk. So I had this crazy idea. Uh, you're going to stand up, and I'm going to be behind you, and you're going to fall, and I'm going to catch you. Hmm. And I'm not going to let you fall. And so, uh, and, and, and you'll see. And, and because he was compliant, you know, he stands up in front of me. He hardly ever moved his arms. And then he'd fall back, and I'd catch him. And then he'd fall back, and I'd catch him. And then suddenly I said, uh-oh, I need to have him catch me. <laughs> and that's where the hard little... Why would you... What, why that? Uh, well, because something inside me said, you know, we ha this has to be reciprocal. I do not know why. Yeah. And, but I had it in my crazy head. And that's where I'm having visions of, you know, I'm going to close my eyes put my arms next to me and I'm going to fall back and I'm going to fall and break my head on the hard Pretty linoleum yeah. and I'm going to die. Really, I, I'm there standing and I'm saying this is crazy, but I think something inside me that said, you got to do this, uh, did this. So I remember, I can just, I can picture I'm standing there, my arms are next to me and I position him behind me. You know, I've never really seen him do anything, you know, uh, He's not frozen, but he's kind of catatonic. And I remember saying to myself, you're going to die. You're going <laughs> to die. It's not good words to tell yourself. <laughs> you know? And what happened? And maybe this will touch you the way it touched me. Maybe what happened is, there I am, my arms are next to my side, close my eyes, and I lean backwards to fall. And I fall six inches, and he catches me. And I look in his eyes and I see life. Wow. And I saw something alive in there. So, um, so I don't know. There were sort of experiences like that. Well, what happened uh, after that? Did he? Um, was there no, some then, no, shift? No, no, or well, did he go well, back no. There was to... there was a shift. I'm not going to say it was like awakenings. Right. But there was a shift, and um, but the shift for me was remember, uh, 
I was still intimidated by medical school. I mean, this was not a blue collar job. I was doing medical type stuff. Right. And I was, I was running around like this little nebbish in Topeka State Hospital. And I'm going around to the psychiatrists. And I'm saying, is this legitimate? This is not like any other specialty. What is this psychiatry thing? I mean, you talk to people. And in those days, it was, even though you medicated people, you talked to them. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was the 70s. You know? yeah. and, uh, uh, and I remember one of them said to me, he said, no, this is a very legitimate field. It's different than the other ones, but it's very legitimate. And you have a knack. Yeah. And so something about that just stuck with me. And so then when I finished that second leave of absence, you know, I went back to medical school and I kept it as my secret, you know, because you'd be ridiculed. What are you going to be when you uh, leave? Well, I'm going to go into psychiatry, you know, because... It, it's looked down upon, you mean? It's, well, even though we're into neuroscience, it's still looked down upon. Hmm. There's, a, there's a saying in medical school, uh, internists... Uh, know everything and do nothing. Surgeons know nothing and do everything. Psychiatrists know nothing and do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> now we'd say, oh no, we are neuroscientists. That's a bunch of BS. We're, st we're still the kid's sisters, uh, you know, in the whole profession. So Mark, how did you then transition from the seeing patients to everything else, executives and... Well, what happened is, okay, so I'm a suicide specialist. I'm a death and dying specialist. Yeah, it's a so big my leap. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so my mentor, Dr. Schneidman, he not only consults to suicidal people, you know, he's asked to consult to people who are dying at home. And so he would get a request and I would go do house calls to dying patients. Wow. And so some of those dying patients were actually CEOs and founders. And, uh, and what happened is after a while, in a number of cases, I got to resolve things in hours that they had never resolved. And I'll tell you, towards the end, it almost became automatic. So I can't say this happened every time. But something that I used more than once, and it's interesting, it's the way I do a consultation, you know, with an executive team. I would go to uh, the dying founder's home, he or she's in the back room, and I, I meet with each of the people, and I do have this eye contact. You know, maybe you can pick that up that I can do that. And so I meet with uh, uh, each of the family members individually. But the key is I develop a rapport with them. Uh, and this ability to sort of look into people, and, they, and, and, and I think it's non-threatening, but people don't know what to do with it. And that's because my look is not to control. My look is kind of like Dean McNary looking at me, and my look says, if you tell me how bad it is or what's wrong, we'll help you. So it's a look that basically says, I'll never judge you. I'll never try and control you. Just tell me what's going on, which is what Dean McNary did with me. And so I formed that bond. So picture this. It's, it, it's, I have that kind of leverage. And then I meet with the family in the living room. And the founder would be in the back room. And I would say, there's a number of things that are clear to me. The first thing is we're running out of time. The second thing is I've spoken to all of you, and there's a few of you that have sizable chips on your shoulder. Uh, and if you don't do anything about those chips, when the founder in the other room who may have contributed to those chips dies, some of you are never going to speak to each other ever again. And I don't think your dad or your mom would be too happy about that. So, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to start apologizing to each other for stuff. And it doesn't have to be recent. It doesn't even have to be accurate because some of it's 30 years old. But you just have to feel it. 
And the person who goes first is the family hero. And they would all look at me in unison like, this guy is off the wall nuts. <laughs> but what would happen is I took charge of the space. Yeah. And one by one, people would start apologizing. I'm sorry that I set you up as the bad sibling while I was the good one. I'm sorry for such and such. And what happened is they just started coming out of the woodwork. And it, and, and, and it, cha and it flexed the entire room. And then, you know, the founder was dying, but one of the siblings was running the company. And they said, can you come in and work with our company? And I said, I don't know. I'm a shrink. I know I deal with backstabbing and jealousy and undermining and lying and posturing. Do you have any of that? And he said, they would say to me, that's all we have. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened is I, I think I learned to be able to see the elephant in the room yeah. and then address it. And I, and I learned to be able to see into people's future. So I'll give you a taste of it with regard to you. I knew this was going to come eventually, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, what you're saying is the only reason I listened to you going on and on is I wanted you to help me. No, no. But, uh... so, so as I look into your future, I see a combination of aspiration and ambition, of passion and purpose. And I see that you see that there is a place for inspiration in the hard-nosed ROI world, and that if you could take these entrepreneurs who are pedal to the metal, alpha males and females, testosterone junkies, and if you can give them a taste of how to inspire their people and touch their customers, uh, they will know success beyond what they ever imagined. And you're determined to help them find that. Uh, so is any of that in sync with kind of where you're going? Sure, yeah, of course. How does that speak to you? Um... You know, just me, it speaks to me that uh, I just need to keep driving ahead, you know, and uh, reaching out to people who can tell some of those stories and uh, do it in a, like kind of like a heartfelt way. You know, when I saw actually the link, when I went to the heartfelt leadership, I saw the link be inspired and immediately started watching those interviews that you conducted. And they're very, very powerful. So here's my... Uh I'm going to give you something, okay? And you're going to use this, and then you tell me, you report back about how it helps, sure. okay? Yeah. So if you're talking inspiration, yada, yada, to a lot of entrepreneurs, you're not going to get a lot of their attention. Let's face it. They want to get, you know, the first, second, third level funding. They got bigger fish to fry. Sure. So here's what you say to them, because they're going to be thinking, yeah, you know, so how's this going to help? Me? So what you say to them is you could say, uh, can I try a hypothetical on you? And hopefully, you know, they have enough, you know, attention span to not blow you off. And they'll, and they'll say, yeah, yeah, okay. And then you say, I'd like you to imagine it's a year from now. Okay, it's a year from now. And you walk out into the community and you walk out amongst your people and the buzz about your company is... Uh, it's the best place to work for. It is an eagle's nest. If you can get in there, you know, beg, borrow, steal to get into that company. It's the most amazing place to work. Uh, and that enthusiasm by your people is uh, only exceeded by the enthusiasm of your customers and clients who say to their friends, uh, have you tried the new blah, blah, blah service? Have you tried the new blah, blah, blah product? Uh, and, and they're going to go out and, and your people and your customers and clients are going to be evangelists. So can you imagine what that would be like? Well, hopefully, you know, they're not so 
you know, focused on ROI that they say, yeah, that would be great. Then you see, let's reverse engineer. So let's imagine your people are saying that and your customers and clients are saying that. And then, so what is it they would need to experience so that they say that? And let's reverse engineer. So when your employees come to work, what the heck goes on at your company that, you know, when they go to cocktail parties, they say, I hit the lottery. Yeah. And when your customers or uh, clients try your stuff, they say, it's better than all the advertising. So what do they, what do they experience? And then let's reverse engineer it. And let's, when we reverse engineer, let's make it seamless. Does that make any sense at yeah, all? Yeah, it makes perfect sense, yeah. So I want you to try that on because you're on a heartfelt mission. You'll, re, you'll report back and tell me uh, you know, how it worked. Will do. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Thanks, Mark. Mark, I know you have to go. One last thing. Um, tell us about heartfelt leadership. What is in the future of heartfelt leadership? Where is it going? And where should people check out so they can uh, go anything from heartfelt leadership or any, uh, any of the other sites for you? Um, well, if people will email me at, um, probably the easiest email is mgoulston, M-G-O-U-L-S-T-O-N, M-G-O-U-L-S-T-O-N, at Mark Goulston, M-A-R-K-G-O-U-L-S-T-O-N dot com. That's probably the easiest way to reach me. I have uh, my heartfelt leadership Email is mark.goulston at hfleader.com. So either one will reach me. But I'll be happy to send anybody who emails me. I've developed a program called Daring to Care, How to Build a Heartfelt Company. And I give away the entire program. You don't need me. And it was in leadership excellence in one of the, the 30th anniversary issue. And uh, you'll get a copy of the table of contents and so in that table of contents I'm sharing space with Jack Welch, Jim Collins, Sir Richard Branson, you know, and little nobody me. And then the second page is the program. And so I've been taking this program out to groups of leaders and CEOs and you can do it in your company. It will change your company forever. And yeah, would I like to do it? Sure. If it really helps your company and you believe in giving back, then contact me and let's start arranging heartfelt leadership events in your community and we'll pull in all the heartfelt leaders uh, and, uh, and we'll do it in your community you know, and together we'll change the world. Yeah. Fantastic. Mark, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Your book just listen is a must read for everyone I, I have a list of books that i read at least once a year and this is hands down uh, one of them so i really appreciate all the time and hard work uh, it went into creating that well you're welcome and, and, and one last thing is i set a world's record for webinar participation at citrix so uh i did one on just listen so if you go to citrix webinar just listen uh, you'll be able to see it for free. You, you have to register at their site, but you, you'll be able to see it for free. And uh, it's a similar to a program that I gave at the Fortune Growth Summit uh, a year ago, and along with people like Tony Shea from uh, from Zappos and Stephen Covey Jr. And uh, you'll be able to see the uh, the webinar for free. And uh, uh, and the person who organizes the Citrix um, summary, I mean, she was very humbling. Right afterwards, she said, I've done 250 of these, and this is the best webinar I've ever seen. So that's free also. Yeah. So, People uh, flat out just need to go get the Audible or they need to buy it on Kindle. I mean, <laughs> you know, they just need well, to... that's look, true. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that, that might help me too. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, and unfortunately, people aren't going to hear, hear this webinar too soon. But it's currently three ninety nine on Kindle. <laughs> so 
that's but we'll crazy. have to we'll have to delete this because when this goes up, it's going to be back to its sixteen right. bucks or something. Right. But but yeah. uh, there you go. But again, again, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Well, I, uh, you didn't get to ask any of your questions though. I you should know, have just listened. I didn't listen. <laughs> no, I listened. <laughs> But, you know, I, yeah. I keep this conversational. It goes where it goes. And I just keep the questions as a guideline. But, um, yeah, very powerful. I don't want to interrupt the flow of the, the powerful stories. So thank you. Well, well, I, uh, well thank you for entrusting me uh, to your audience. Yes. Take care. Bye, Mark. <laughs>